a whole other way of looking at compliments, isn't it? Yeah, it's very subtle. I mean, this this is something that, um, you know, when you study the masters and you, they have such a compassion and caring, and they are very concerned with their pupils' thoughts and mm -hmm. their beliefs, and mm -hmm. they are constantly um, helping point out those things in a very gentle way. But um, as far as complimenting, especially when you get to appearances or or even uh, particular traits and so on and so forth, I mean, it can be very supportive. Um, there can be certain traits that um, are reflections of holy relationship, are reflections of, of purity of thought that, um, that you can rejoice in with one another. But when we say compliment one again, once again, we're, we're really focusing on the, the ego's attempt to complement the body and um, or particular skills that are associated with the body mm -hmm. to raise them up as being important and literally attempt to saying, you know, this is great. You have improved. You're a better self than you were before. Mm -hmm. And it still maintains that construct. It doesn't uh, get beyond it. That's why the, um, the admonition, as it were, not to adorn the body in a way that draws attention to it. It's that, it's that very thing of, of um, adding some reality to what's just a body, some importance to that. Make something of nothing. Up, make something of nothing. Yeah. And it's not often seen that way, but but if uh, if God is spirit and Christ is spirit, and the body is nothing, and the mind attempts to raise up or make important that which is non-existent, <laughs> mm -hmm. then obviously we have a major um, identity deception that's that's going on here and. Uh, by withdrawing the investment in appearances and how things look, mm -hmm. um, the, and and focusing the mind's attention on on healing or that one intent, you could call it forgiveness, the miracle, however you want to mm -hmm. go with the words, it's it's relinquished, it's it's laid aside, it's outgrown. Why would a mind that would see the body as nothing want to put any of its mind toward nothing? Yes. You know, why would it want to spend time, energy, dolling up and beautifying uh, nothing? Yes. And it would only want to do that if it, wanted, if it believed it was that thing. Mm -hmm. and that it was, was its, something. That was its chosen home. Mm -hmm. And it could actually make better that home. So, you know, once you can start to see the metaphysics of, mm -hmm. of what's going on, then it's not a sacrifice to... Start saying. I mean, the form changes will flow automatically from the changes in perception, mm -hmm. the changes in thinking. Mm -hmm. It's not the other way around. Otherwise, you fall into the ascetic trap. Of changing the form mm -hmm. when the content in the mind hasn't been changed at all. Yes. Yeah, that's sacrifice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's deprivation. Yes, there's a part of the mind that, that is going to do it. It'll go through with it because the book said so, or this and this and this, but there's still a belief that it, it, at some level that it still has a value. Mm -hmm. and I'm, there's, a, there's a conflict that goes on in the mind then, because the mind is yeah. split. That's where the resentment would come in. Mm -hmm. Like a coercion. a coercion. I'm doing this for God, mm -hmm. I'm doing this for because Jesus tells me I have to, and so on and so forth. So Jesus wants us to, to start thinking like him. And then... The, the behavior automatically follows from the thoughts, but thought, the thought level or the mind level is the only place where um, significant, where change, true change can take place. Changing the form per se as if it was possible to just change form. It's like changing constructs and, and, um, and holding the belief in the construct in mind still, and mm -hmm. that doesn't solve anything. I can notice what goes on at a form level and use that to start bringing it back to my mind and my beliefs. I mean, I can notice how much time I spend coloring my hair or styling
curling my hair or soaking in a bubble bath or whatever. Whatever I do that, you know, that pampers or beautifies the body. And just notice that I have I have placed some value in the body, obviously, by, t by putting that much toward it. Mm -hmm. And then just use that as a signal to go back in the mind and look at, you know, what, what's really going on there. What's the construct that's held in place that would have me put that kind of mind toward a body? Mm -hmm. What is it for? What's it for? What is right. all this dolling up and so on and so forth for? I mean, when you can really ask a fundamental question like that, then you can start to get a sense of, uh, of the construct because those actions and attempts, the mind is act asking the body to, to play out fantasies that, that seem to reinforce that it is a body. It can have fantasies of, of, of pleasure, it can have fantasies of pain, it can have fantasies of attack and defense, so on and so forth. But, but the fantasies, um, it, can no more, it, it can no more truly attack, the mind can, but, but it can have fantasies of, of, of attack. Mm -hmm. If the mind could truly attack, then guilt would be justified. And the separation could have happened, yes. I guess, in that in that framework. Yes, and and the attack thought that Jesus talks about in the lessons, you know, um, I'm only vulnerable to my own attack thoughts. Um, my attack thoughts are attacking my invulnerability. For instance, a lesson like that, it's still speaking at the split mind level. I mean, those attack thoughts are are in the wrong mind or are part of a, a split mind and part of the construct that yes. we're talking about and the healing comes mm -hmm. from from pulling back and dis disidentifying from being able to watch those things with those attack thoughts without horror instead of being horrible terrifying attack thoughts they're just unreal thoughts and therefore the the horror is, is gone from the right mind there is those thoughts are not horrifying <laughs> Because <laughs> they're known that they're, it's known that they're unreal. The Holy Spirit does not buy the false beliefs. Mm -hmm. He's anchored in, he knows the true identity of the the Son and the Source. So with relationships, it's it's um, it comes back to the mind watching. I mean, it's watching the feelings, watching my noticing my feelings and reactions. Those are my trigger points. Those are my clues. Offer a gateway for me to to go in and question the self-concept, question my false beliefs and, and associations. That thing that you were talking about seemed kind of large and overwhelming. That leap to do that um, moment by moment is the golden opportunity of of uh, if one can watch one's feelings and and. Uh, and have a willingness to see the world differently. A willingness to withdraw the meaning that had been read into and given to the world, to the perceptions. And that seems to be accelerated when in, re in so-called relationship with someone that doesn't always see eye to eye with me. Every, every relationship, those... Of course, yeah. even if the person seems to see eye to eye with me, there's all that stuff that comes up about intimacy. <laughs> but yeah. it doesn't have to be, you know, the acceleration doesn't have to come about through being in so-called relationship with someone that I'm at odds with, as it were. Yeah, it's it, really breaking it apart. I mean, even saying that, that there are special love relationships and special hate, I mean, those are just the flip sides of um, this desire to see the split. I mean, there's the split again. Mm -hmm. the, the desirable friends and the undesirable friends, the good guys, the bad guys. You know, once again, it gets back to that, the mind wanting to see that split 
out in the world. There really is no difference. I mean, relationship is, uh, real relationship is a state of mind. It's not dependent on, on anything external. And when we speak about special love and special hate, I mean, these are metaphors as well for uh, a trick that the mind's trying to do. As if it knows what love is. You know, attraction, attachment, these are words that uh, might be more suitable to love as this world sees it. You and fantasy. Yes, meet my needs. Mm -hmm. It's a humbling thought to, to remember that I don't really know what love is. And that anything I have thought has been love in this world has not. And that is an open mind that can that can begin to get a glimmer of that. Because the seeking and the pursuing it goes with that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean there's with the change of perception, with the with the relinquishment of judgment, there comes a more stabilized perception and feelings of peace, feelings of wholeness and joy and completion and and the seeking ends. Well, when I don't know what I'm looking for, <laughs> I mean, when I don't, when I acknowledge I don't know what it is, and I wouldn't recognize it probably if I saw it, then I guess it's kind of pointless to keep seeking in that respect. Yeah, even the deceived mind can, can say, in a sense, I'm looking for love, I'm looking for happiness. I just want to be happy. But it's, it's where one is looking for it. I mean, the deceived mind counsels, the ego says, look out in the world. Look into the darkened glass, as it says in Corinthians, you know. Uh, look look for, for idols, um, for forms that will, that will bring your happiness. So the mind is still looking for happiness, but it's just looking outward into the projection to find it, whereas inward is where where it can be found. The light in the mind that, that the false beliefs and the concepts and the constructs have covered over is, uh, is where happiness is, is where um, love is.